Hi, you welcome back to the track. So our next presentation is um, great because it's people from here, from the Film Academy that has been created, that created FMX to start with and are running this great school here where they're teaching computer graphics and filmmaking in all kinds of different ways. Our next speakers are part of the um, departments that do uh, research and development. Volker Elsley is uh, head of research at the Film Academy. Um, he has joined the Film Academy in 2003 um, as a supervisor of the Research and Development Department. In 2013, he received the Honorary Professorship of Film Academy Baden-Württemberg and um, heads the department and the project that is going to give us uh, many projects, one of them being the, the one he's going to talk with us about. And with his colleague Simon Spielman, who's principal R&D engineers here at the, at the Academy, I'm glad to welcome Volker and Simon in the virtual production track. Please come on up. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, I will start with a quick introduction about our affiliation, uh, Animationsinstitut at Filmakademie Baden-Württemberg. It was established in 1991 and it is located in Ludwigsburg, which is about 20 kilometers north of here. Um, you can study about any course related to filmmaking at Film Academy, directing, cinematography, screenwriting production or animation. If you happen to be in animation, then after the basic two years of study, you will come to the Animationsinstitut, which is an autonomous entity within Film Academy. It was established in 2002. Film Academy has about 600 students in total and uh, about 100 of those are in animation. About our research and development uh, lab, we have a very uh, thin basic funding, basically that's the funding for my uh, position, and out of that um, we work on, on bringing projects in Film Academy and additional funding into the um, uh, R&D lab. So we are involved in a lot of regional projects, but also more recently into European projects. There is a very strong link to the animation effects and game industry. That is um, because of our teaching structure at Film Academy and the teaching structure is based uh, on bringing industry professionals in Film Academy and having them talk about a specific topic um, of their expertise so that way we make sure that uh, all the contents that uh, our, our students learn are up to date. Also, we have very strong ties to our alumni, the graduates that go out and work in the industry as effects professionals, as technical directors, but some of them go also into engineering and research. Our R&D group is also in charge of the technical director program. It's a postgraduate course at Film Academy, more targeted towards uh, technically challenging aspects of media productions. And um, with them, we work on um, our research projects and they also initiate their own projects. Uh, one of the um, important things for our research work is that we want to make sure the work ends up in a um, production scenario where it can be used. So I will start with a quick overview of uh, the presentation we've prepared. So uh, I want to introduce you to a couple of um, uh, prot prototypes, tool prototypes, and also productions that touch aspects of virtual production. And uh, then I will give you a quick introduction into a large EU project on the topic of uh, virtual production, Project Dreamspace. And after that, my colleague Simon Spielmann, who is our lead engineer, he will take over and give you more of the technical insight into the tools we developed within this project. And uh, after the project finished, we also continued that development. Let's start with uh, the previous art. Uh, that is actually a project that goes back into 2007, from uh, initiated from Jörg Unterberg and Andreas Dahn. And um, the ingredients for that prototype tool for previous and um, uh, shot layout was AR Toolkit and touch design of uh, the video feed with that um, CG element. Well, the interesting aspect is really that you have an haptical object that you can move in space uh, and then also record this uh, movement. 
The same can be applied to lights. and a virtual camera, which is in this case just a display with a marker on top of it. And you can use it to scout uh, into the scene, find the right angle, uh, change uh, fields of view, and record all that data. So yeah, graphics are really simple. And again, this is 2007. Um, uh, but they, the, the principle and the idea uh, worked uh, really well. And actually, uh, most recently, we had uh, guests from uh, Sweden, Mirko Lempert from the Stockholm University of the Arts and Simon Alexanderson from the Royal Institute of Technology. They are working into a somewhat similar direction using uh, motion capture volume and tracking markers. And we did a workshop with students at Film Academy uh, using Unity as a game engine, and it was received very well. On previous thought, there's actually a um, abstract that you can find in the ACM library. It's been presented at SIGGRAPH Asia 2008. The next project I'd like to present is Motherland by Hannes Appel from 2011. Um, it was planned as a visual effects, traditional visual effects project at Film Academy, but at the time, he was pl Hannes was planning the project, the CryEngine 2, and crisis became available, and he was just so um, blown away from the capabilities of the real-time engine that he started to experiment if it would be possible to do this production in using the game engine. And then he got support by one of our TDs, uh, particularly for bringing camera data into the Cry engine. And um, uh, let's take a look at some before and after shots, and then you see the elements that were um, shot by camera. And all um, CG assets that you see are created in the CryEngine, and uh, then they fed a traditional offline post-processing workflow. Here's some reflection passes directly from within the engine. Yeah. And then here there's a, a quite big asset, one of the tanks that um, also completely is rendered uh, from within the engine. And that's the final shot. So there is a uh, very nice um, anecdote. Yeah, I said that already. That's fit uh, a traditional workflow. But there's a nice anecdote of. Um, uh, this video here and the functionality behind it. So the CryEngine ha didn't have much capabilities to feed a, a film uh, production workflow. So we had to trigger these scripts to render different passes in the background. Um, those melon render script manager um, uh, was triggered by punching one of the melons. So Motherland is on YouTube. You can see the final result there. Dark matter has been created in 2013, and, and this was a continuation of our close collaboration with uh, Crytek. Uh, the project has been directed by Hendrik Wyszakowski. Uh, Jaffa Sahin was the technical person in charge of it. A uh, big difference to um, Motherland was that uh, we had access to a prototype that uh, would uh, support more the needs of, of filmmaking. Um, on s and for use on, on, on a live uh, environment on set. It was called Cinebox. Some of you might also know the later version as Film Engine. And um, we used a real-time camera track uh, by just using a mocap volume and adding markers on top of our principal camera. That worked so-so. Um, it, it was okay. We have better solutions now for camera real-time camera tracking, I would say. 
It was an interesting obs observation. So the team uh, of, of uh, the director and artists and technical people really bought into the idea of being able to see most of the digital, um, uh, of all of the digital uh, elements directly on set. But um, for some of them who had experience in um, uh, visual effects, and asset creation, it really was a challenge to, to create an asset for a game engine in terms of pulley limits, in terms of limitations for character rigs. So that was a, one of the observations we, we got out of Dark Matter. And there's also more information in the ACM library if you're interested in reading that. So now there's a making of video that uh, shows you a bit of the, of the process and, and how the team worked with the engine on set. I'll take a look at that. In the summer of 2003, a group of students of the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg joined forces to produce a sci-fi action short. To visualize the massive amount of visual effects shots, they decided to create a virtual production set, combining motion capturing and the Cinebox software developed by Crytek. The combination of different technical devices provided them a real-time preview, gaining the possibility to watch the actors live, integrated into the virtual set. Du coup, ça te permet d'imaginer et euh, vu qu'il y a du nouveau matériel, tu, tu imagines pas mal de choses et en même temps, derrière ça, tu as un rendu et du coup, ton travail et comme ça, tu, tu progresses. Ja, geil ist natürlich, dass ich äh, von meinem Editor Live-Feedback bekomme, gerade wenn wir eine postproduktionslastige Shoot haben, der sehr aufwendig ist, was äh, den Aufbau angeht, drehen wir natürlich nur auf Schnitt. Security Code Alpha Echo 7. Also wir hatten gerade natürlich ein Problem mit dem Motion Capture System, weil wir drei Markerpunkte haben und wenn sich halt ein Markerpunkt bewegt, dann findet er das Objekt an sich nicht mehr. Dass wir natürlich seitens des Lichts viel bessere Möglichkeiten jetzt haben, wirklich präzise zu leuchten, weil wir nicht mehr von der Vorlage ausgehen müssen, sondern wir haben das Bild direkt auf dem Monitor und sehen, wie die Darsteller im Set stehen und nicht mehr äh, wie sonst gewöhnlich vor Grün. The director of Jagon is Murat uh, Gonultas, and uh, technical people in charge were again Jaffa Sain, Fabian Fricke, and Julian Weiss. We used in Jagon, um, there's an a intensive martial arts scene performed by real actors, real martial art professionals, so not digital doubles, but the a location where this was filmed was in a forest, and it came with a lot of constraints in order. Uh, of where are trees, where can uh, dolly rails be. So the idea was to bring those martial art performers into the studio, motion capture them, and then use a virtual camera system to um, work with the data that was gathered to figure out the best camera angles and also uh, parts of the choreography. Um, yeah, so that uh, worked quite well, and um, again, we have a nice making of that shows you this process and gives you a bit insight into uh, the atmosphere at the studio. <laughs> So the last of the productions that I'd like to mention is The Wall of Death by Elke Fowler and Felix Zehnde. Uh, it's our first fully animated um, uh, production using Unreal 4 engine, uh, full CG. And um, 
we used motion capture to capture um, heavy metal bugs at a rock festival. That's actually what the, the whole uh, project was used for as an advertisement for a um, live event. And uh, it took six months from idea to final render, which um, is quite fast uh, for in terms of Film Academy as a project. Well, now uh, I'd like to say a few words about the EU-funded project DreamSpace, which had a, a very strong focus on virtual production technologies. In 2012, we've been approached um, to contribute to a proposal that we submitted to the EU, and uh, that proposal actually got greenlit. And under the um, leadership of Foundry as industry lead in the project, um, Project DreamSpace started in, in fall 2013. It was a three-year project. Industry partners were Foundry, like I said, Encom and Stargate Germany, and the academic partners uh, were iMinds in um, Hasselt in Belgium, uh, Saarland University with the Visual Intervisual Computing Institute, Crew, and Film Academy. Um, <laughs> Project Green Space has been really big and there were tons of, of uh, work packages and technology and research being carried out, just to name a few of them. Uh, 360 stitching, real-time compositing, depth reconstruction, accelerated ray tracing. Um, so you can read up all of that uh, on the official website. Film Academy has been mostly involved in uh, evaluating the developments within an, a practical uh, production processes at Film Academy. But there was also one key objective where we, um, where we were involved in quite intensively, and that was to research and develop methods of designing, directing, navigating, editing, and modifying virtual productions in a collaborative environment with intuitive methods of controlling creative parameters. To do so, the first thing we did uh, in 2015 was to create a prototype based on an Oculus DK1 with uh, we are quite big tracking markers in a mocap volume. And then we mounted a webcam on top of uh, that setup so we could have an augmented view into the scene. Additionally, we mounted a Magic Leap uh, motion sensor around the belly of the participants. And by that, we were able to look into um, uh, a space where we could see a character being performed live by a person wearing a mocap suit. And then through hand gestures, we could um, choose some axis and move objects around in space. And um, we wanted to explore whether or not this is a, a viable path to go and to further develop. So there has been an evaluation, um, and in terms of um, orientation and navigation in space, that scored quite good results, but when it came to selection and manipulation of objects, the scores uh, became significantly worse. And uh, there's a lot more information about all of this setup in the CVMP 2015 paper, if you're interested in reading this. But the results of, of this evaluation led us to the decision to create these editing tools based on tablets and touch interaction um, within DreamSpace. And that's what some of you might know or heard of as VPAD, the virtual production editing tools. 
So um, there's actually a couple of components, and Simon Spielmann will um, uh, soon introduce it to those. For now, I will show you a video of uh, how VPET's been used in different scenarios, mostly during DreamSpace, which ended 2016. So um, there's new stuff um, that we're not showing in this video, but for now, just to give you an impression on how we interact collaboratively with the VPET tools. I'd like to um, mention one production that happened during the development of VPET and that was a subject for us in, in our evaluation process that was uh, the Skywriter production, which actually is a documentary film about a family business in skywriting advertisements in the sky. And uh, the director Niels Otte uh, came up with the idea to add visual effects uh, shots to the production to make it um, uh, more valuable and so the idea was born if this could happen in a virtual production environment and um, all in all it's four full CG shots and um, this is Niels Otte, the director, um, he's uh, uh, a documentary student and uh, he himself says he's not a, not a technical person, but after an introduction and about 10 to 15 minutes, he was able to move airplanes uh, from A to B, animate them, trigger them whenever he felt appropriate and, and really interact with those digital assets. The whole setup, and you've seen some of um, that footage in, in the video, um, we also use the virtual camera system with the ANCAM tracking bar. Usually the ANCAM system is mounted to a principal camera. You can calibrate the lenses quite um, precisely and um, uh, do augmented reality and save the data for later on post-production. But you can also use it in a uh, fully virtual setup. So um, uh, Konrad Lobs, the director of photography, he had this um, screen here where you could see uh, the virtual camera feed, but also there was a bit uh, projection in the studio where everybody could see uh, what is the actual frame and, and how does it look. So it was all in all a, a very um, a direct and collaborative process that um, uh, directly uh, between the director of photography and um, Nils Otte, the director. Um, yeah. So that data was recorded uh, and then used in, in a traditional offline workflow where it was rendered through Arnold and then composited. That's it in a nutshell for productions and the scope of, of DreamSpace. And now my colleague Simon Spielmann, who's our lead engineer uh, within our research group, he will give you some more details about VPAD, the technical components, and how it can be used um, generically. Thank you. Thank you, Volker. So, hello, guys, again. I'm pretty sure you cannot wait it to get some more details <laughs> from our tool. So let's start here. So VPAD, again, what is it? It's our virtual production editing tool, and we call it an 
holistic approach for established offline pipelines. And what this means is um, that VPAD constitutes a generic real-time and open source framework that can be in integrated into any existing production workflow at this point. Our philosophy here is tools should adapt to artists and not artists to tools. Um, and it's not constrained to any uh, central production system. So it's designed in a way that you can adopt it to any th anything you need here at this point. So the core components are the VPAD client itself, which is basically a Unity application, um, a scene distribution plugin, or first of all, a scene distribution protocol, which is then a plugin. We already pr uh, provide a plugin for uh, the look and lighting development tool Katana from Foundry and Unity itself. But as I said, it's an, uh, it's an already defined uh, protocol you can easily adapt with an API to your uh, DCC application of your choice, Maya, whatever. And uh, we also have a scene synchronization, which is necessary to, on the one side, um, synchronize every client which are connected to our server. You will see this in a moment. So that every scene added is then distributed over all connected clients on the one side and on the other side also uh, the whole recording that you have this data later back again in the post-production. It's also done in this synchronization server. So, But first of all, I would like to show you how you would need to set up your scenery if you really want to use VPAD. It's quite easy, so, but you have to take care of that, of course, we are here dealing with real-time engines and we are running it typically on, on tablets. So you have to take care of your rendering budget. So that means typically you would need to create a uh, proxy geometry. For example, here in this, in this scene, it's a katana, what you see here, you have two versions of this share and high poly high quality uh, uh, version and then a low pro, um, poly version, which will be then streamed to your client. This is absolutely in sync. So that means if you then later on edit your, your share or whatever uh, on your tablet, this will also be synchronized back into Katana or whatever tool you, you are using here. Uh, on the other side, um, there will be or there are editing flags so that you can choose which objects are editable at all and which not just to simplify uh, the, the amount of, of possibilities you have there and such. Um, yes. okay. Before we started the development, we did a quite huge evaluation of available platforms. So um, what is the question, what is the best choice for our tools? We uh, would not like to reinvent the wheel here, so that's the reason why we, we, we looked closer to the available basis. Um, so we took a cl closer look to Blender, XML3D, Frapper, which is our own in-house uh, real-time tool we developed some years ago, Max MSP, Unity, Motion Builder, Shark 3D, Unreal Engine, and also the Cry Engine. And um, we evaluated by um, coming up with a small task. You can read it here. So it was uh, the creation of a small interactive scenery and uh, the export of, of um, objects from a TCC package. Uh, at this point in time, it was 2014, I think. Uh, Unity uh, was the best choice here. Uh, it satisfies a lot of our needs. And additional to this, documentation and examples are quite good for this. You probably already know this. There's an, there are already a lot of functionality you do not have to reinvent. And you have also a, a quite huge community. So. Exactly. Um, this is a basic setup you can see here. This is how such a system will work at all. So you can see in the middle is uh, this host called uh, block, which uh, consists of uh, our scene distribution machine, whatever it is, Catania Unity or whatever tool you integrated it, and uh, the synchronization. So on the right side, you can see clients. Well, as an example, let's say a free clients, but it's not limited at all. Um, and on the lower side, um, something interesting, a client is not necessarily a tablet. It could also be a desktop machine, which is then connected, for example, to a DMX controller to control real sites, real lights on a real set. 
So for example, if you change your light intensity, your light color or whatever on your tablet in your virtual scenery, uh, it is possible to also steer uh, real light on a real set. Um, on the other side is, of course, also possible to stream in data. Uh, in this example, you can see um, a, a camera tracking system, which then enables us to have the position, orientation, and motion at all, uh, as well as camera focus and all the parameters provided by the system directly in VPAD. So that means if uh, your DOP is changing the camera, whatever, everything is also reflected in real time in your uh, application and can, of course, also be recorded for later on. OK, data exchange. I already mentioned it, so I would like to show it here. We have our scene transfer, which is one core element of, of the whole system. Uh, basically, it's a DCC plugin already available for Catania Unity, which is gathering your scene information out of your scene in the DCC application, and then later on, on request, sends it to, to all the clients. Um, at the moment, we only support the hierarchy of elements at all, then basic geometry and really basic uh, shading with textures. But also here, if you need it, it's really easily uh, extendable with materials, shaders, whatever. Then on the synchronization side, um, that's basically a standalone application, small command line tool which uh, runs independently and, and uh, every client would then connect to the server and um, distribute all changes through the network. It also takes care of things that you cannot edit at the same time one object and things like this. Um, for Katana, uh, it's a nice example here because Katana already provides a network communication interface. Uh, therefore, we used another protocol which is included into VPAT to directly feed this uh, interface there. Yeah. So, scene transfer, how does it work? So basically, uh, your client requesting uh, a lot of packages from your host application, and at the moment you, you got things like the, the header, which, which includes global scene information, then a node, which could be, well, a node is basically a, a, a basis, uh, including transforms, the type, the hierarchy, and the name of an object, then specialized version of these nodes, which could be uh, geometry, lights, cameras, etc. And you see it here, um, all of these uh, uh, nodes have several types of objects and, and, and data, which will be then transferred. Uh, at the end, the mesh, no, <laughs> almost at the end, the mesh containing vertices, indices, normals, and UVs, and the texture. That's basically our um, uh, package bundle we are currently using here. So then a sync message is similar to this. So. Um, it's basically a string containing the edit information. Um, it contains the topic, so that means uh, what type of client you have. It is, is it just a tablet? Is it, uh, is it coming from a tracking, or is it the recording? Uh, then we have a, a client unique identifier. Then the parameter type itself, what, 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 is, what happens now at the moment, what was changed, so is it the position, the rotation, light, etc. And then the parameter values itself. So this is basically a set of numbers. Uh, at the, then the next is the editing path, so that the system knows, OK, this, this object now has been edited, and it is in our scene hierarchy there. And uh, at the end, some additional information uh, regarding the physics and locking information. Mm, all these information, the point here is that everything I, I showed you can also be recorded, which is really crucial at this point. Um, how does this work? So track and record uh, scene changes. So a um, message can basically be stored on a disk. Uh, this happens in the sync server. Uh, I already said this. And here we are really recording raw data. That means at the end you will get a raw file containing all these information. So you have to take care. So it, it has pros and cons at this point, so you have to take care of how you interpret this data, but basically you do cannot lose any data at all. Um, the recording itself, it's a quite tricky process, because what we are 
having here is a decentralized system. So at, at the end, you have, a, let's say, we have a game engine running on a tablet or several tablets. Every tablet has its own frame, frame call and frame rate running to, uh, completely independent from each other. Uh, all these calls, draw calls, are not synchro synchronized. This leads to something we call uh, animation aliasing. So what happens here is, oh, oh, oh. is basically, let's say we have a parameter, something, let's say, an X translation, which cha changes over time. But you can see here this curve just shows uh, every, every frame which is triggered, or on every frame uh, the, the uh, value has changed uh, over time, and this data is for sent from one client to the other. But the other client then also runs with a different frame rate. And you can see it here easily, uh, you have these overlap regions which are shifting to left and right, and this exactly leads to animation stutter and things like this. In reality, it's even more critical, because in reality, you also have things like this, that the frame rate will, for example, vary over time. This is even more complicated. So now you can think about how to synchronize all this stuff, but even then, it's really, really crucial at this point, and I would really like to see this in, in in uh, game engines already uh, implemented, because this would be really nice for applications like this. Um, because at the moment, you cannot really say what time, even if you take care of synchronizing all your stuff. For example, let's say we have a central instance which triggers the frame call. You cannot say how many time will happen until the frame appears on your screen, or until the frame is recorded to, to your disk. Uh, and at this point, really, we need the help of the engine developers to uh, come forward to this point. And yeah. So, OK, then our last developments. Um, maybe you have heard of it, but I will uh, recap this uh, again a little bit. Um, in the last months, the big companies released frameworks for tracking tablet devices, mobile devices, inside out. That means uh, your, your tablet knows not only the orientation in room, it also in, uh, knows the position in room. And they're quite sophisticated in this, and we adapted this to VPAD because an, it enables us to do augmented reality directly in, on set. Mm. Next to this, we also added um, more physical uh, um, uh, controlling devices to, to, uh, to uh, this tablet, which is quite easily mountable, cheap solution here, but it has a lot of advantages in, in steering around. The guys of you who, who, who played games probably knows this. So if, have you ever played a jump and run game on a touch screen? It's horrible. If you really have these triggers, you, can, you have really m much more fidelity uh, uh, to control all this stuff. Nevertheless, you can also use the whole uh, touch screen uh, uh, interaction. Uh, if you want to have more information, it's also available in the CVMP paper from 2017 reference there. So, and now you can see VPAD and Mr. Helsler in action. Okay, Volker, on bitte. Hi there, we're here at Studio 2 of Film Academy. It's also called the Albrecht Ade Studio, named after the founder of Film Academy. As you can see, we have this beautiful set built by our production design department. A real set. And today, we're going to look at using the VPAD tools with augmented reality. All right, so the whole set has been designed digitally. It was very helpful for us. We could use the data to generate the storefronts and uh, the right scale. First thing we need to do is to synchronize the real and the virtual world. And to do so, I tap on the AR button and you see the camera feed. The next thing is you slide along um, the display to place an anchor point. And now you need to rotate this anchor point with a two finger gesture. You can always reposition it and then we load our scene. Now we can take a look at um, an extended balcony and storefront and if I move to the left you can see that there is another building standing right here 
I created a little animation for uh, this Zeta here, so you can see three simple keyframes. So the Zeta will be driving right up to us. Remember, VPET is a suit where you can use a synchronization server and a distribution plugin um, tied to a professional production pipeline. In our case, we're using Katana or Unity itself. Yes, so at the end, um, everything is also well documented and uh, available via GitHub. And since Monday night, it's also on. It's the virtual production editing tool. So thank you for your attention and there are more information. Any yeah, questions? I think we're we're ready for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. And uh, yeah, maybe maybe we should also mention that we uh, yeah, put in strong effort into into making this available uh, uh, on 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 a large platform. And um, the uh, supported phones from Apple on, and, and tablets are are really accessible. The Haptical interface you saw, I think it's 80 bucks or something. So the costs to, to create a scenario for virtual production are really uh, coming down. And I think it's a great time to engage into these ideas. Yeah. Right, uh, this was the point why we selected uh, AR kit from Apple because it's running on nearly every device uh, from the last four years. So yeah. it's quite a lot. Okay, any questions in the audience? Hey guys, um, thanks for showing this awesome work um, and for making it available for everyone. That's that's really exciting. Um, I would be interested to hear, um, you mentioned there's a central server steering all this and then devices that can connect to it and stuff. So uh, how long does it take to actually set up, set this up um, for, let's say, if I want to transfer the scene or to set up the scene? Uh, I mean the whole infrastructure behind it, like so installing the server and blah, 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 and all this. What it's, you it's quite straightforward. So it's basically just a Wi-Fi. So every client is connecting Wi-Fi to your, to, your, to your system. So what you need is a Wi-Fi router, a standard PC running Katana or Unity. And then this plugin installed, and then you have to prepare your scene, of course. But mm -hmm. you probably have this already beforehand, and then it's all. Then you can start it, and then we'll distribute mm -hmm. it. That's all. So basically, it could be uh, 30 minutes. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think there's questions here. For the synchronization of data, um, mm -hmm. do you, do you use a time code or something like this uh, to have synchronization, like outside of the f frame rate of the individual devices? Um, yes and no. So uh, at the moment, not. But we 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 made this for the Skywriters production, for example, because there it was crucial to mm -hmm. really know what happens when. But yeah. Uh, do you consider to use the Lighthouse Tracker for the tracking information? Because now it's only inside-out tracking, I mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider to use that technology, or is it uh, not on your plans? For camera tracking, you for, mean? For yeah. camera tracking and position tracking of the objects. Mm. You could do this, but at the moment, we have another professional system in-house, okay. which is quite good. So yeah. there's no need, but you could do but this, of course. I think if 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 you want to get really precise checking data um, and, and work with a principal camera, there's, there's, you know, there's a limit uh, yeah. because it will always have a, a, a fixed field of view. Um, there's nothing you can do about this. You, you can extend it, I think, in the, in the version 2, you can extend the field with another devices, so you have the possibility to 10 devices or more. Okay. 
Well, I, I think the use case we showed that yeah. I think that's that's probably what we want to um, uh, establish because it's it's very easy, it's very applicable. Mm -hmm. It might have glitches in the tracking, but yeah. it gives you an idea of what that scene would look like in the end, or how it could look with maybe different designs of a storefront or a background and these things. But for really replacing it in Final Track, yeah. a tracking system like Encom is certainly desirable. Okay. Then again, I okay. it's a trade-off. I mean, yeah, mounting sure. the Encom system and calibrating your lenses, and you know, it's half of a day. Um, so I think you know, it's not one or the other, and, and certainly AR kit has limitations, but it's fantastic to what it can do already on, on, on a huge amount of devices. Um, so uh, yeah, it might not be suitable for every okay. case. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Cortana is always necessary on your synchronization server, uh, and and the question is, um, is that the full version of Cortana or, or just a plug-in? So for Cortana, it's just a plug-in. So and the synchronization server is standalone, and you can run it. Yeah. Or what, can you repeat the first yeah. part of the uh, question? Also I'm not sure I got the question. Well, I, I wonder what the requirements are. I mean, uh, do we huh? need a license to this uh, plugin? Uh, is this expensive? And uh, do you always need this on the server, this Katana? OK, the license situation. So the, the Katana license situation, or which situation? Yes. So, uh, oh, well, I, yeah, of course, you need Katana license. But I think you can download a, a free version, and again, to to make this clear, the reason uh, for choosing Katana here is a historical reason, because uh, we have very close connections to Foundry within the DreamSpace project. On the other side, I think um, what Simon mentioned in the beginning of his talk that we want to adapt the pipeline to the skills of of artists is uh, is a good use, uh, a good example within Katana. You have a lot of people that know how. Um, to work within Katana to set up a scene, very complex scene, so being able to branch out into an interactive environment from such an uh, uh, established pipeline was an interesting thing to investigate. And along that path, uh, tied, of course, our clients are Unity technology, but uh, y you're not tied to a decision where you say, like, okay, from now on, this is going to be it. We're using this as the central production system if you want to do virtual production you have a lot of flexibility. All you would need to do is to adapt your synchronization messages and uh, write a distribution plugin, which I would think a skilled TD engineer would take them maybe two to three days, and then that should work. As a reference implementation, you can look into, so. You know. yeah. I think there's a question in the back here. So if I understand this correctly, the, all the uh, VPAD clients, uh, you sync the scenes basically to the VPAD clients and then run that on the clients. Um, so this can obviously be like a bottleneck for uh, these, these low-end devices. Have you considered uh, using more of a like, thin client and like rendering it on a workstation and just sending the feed back um, to kind of get around that bo bottleneck? It is basically already a thin client, and this is exactly what happens. For example, if you use Katana, that's your backend, and Katana is capable of uh, feeding all these scene changes or the actual scene into a renderer, which could be also a real-time renderer. Um, we have a video in there. Um, um, I'm not sure if we have the time to show it again. But you can see there, there is a production renderer on set, which renders in high quality the scene edits. And you can see already this, the edits you do with the tablet and the scenery. Here, down there. Yeah, maybe, click, maybe this point wasn't clear enough. Um, yeah. So here, here you can see the tablet moving around uh, a light, and then there's the accelerated ray tracer in the back from yeah. Saarland University. Yeah, what what yeah. you see there is basically yeah. a small render farm 
uh, utilize to render on, on this, this ray tracer mm -hmm. here or pass tracer uh, a physically correct version of the scenery in high quality. And the idea is for the client in the way we, we build it right now is not to necessarily provide you with a super high quality um, version of the scene, even though it might be possible if you spend a lot of time. But you would always have your host application in the back that could either perform a real-time rendering, it can be Unity itself as a host application, or it could be Katana in that case. Um, uh, this is actually, it's not Katana, it's called Live View. It was a research prototype, but it used a lot of Katana technology. But yeah, this is very flexible, and the thought about this is more that you would perform the interaction, you have enough information on the tablet in terms of what does the light look like um, and uh, where is the asset, can I animate it, I want it more to the left, more to the right. Uh, could I ask uh, a follow-up question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So does that mean there can only be like one central host uh, that kind of hosts that high quality Kanana? Because I think uh, on set, if you work like with directors and um, yeah, DPs, like everybody kind of wants to see the high quality image and maybe like in a VR headset and kind of collaborate. So there's usually like the need for more than one kind of high quality output. Um, well, there are several answers to this question. So <laughs> <laughs> in general, yes, of course, that's the idea to only have one centralized system because it could also be a render farm rendering high quality stuff but uh, it's quite easy to, to display these, these r rendered high quality uh, images or to dis distribute this to whatever set stuff. At the moment, it's not part of VPAD. You, in VPAD, you cannot mm -hmm. see the high quality rendering. Yeah. Sure, you can also stream uh, uh, just the uh, rendering result to, um, to a client. Uh, there's work for a research work from Foundry that I think is published in one of their regional projects where they did this with Unreal. Uh, it's one way. Yeah, I mean, it's all sorts of things one could extend or <laughs> add to it. <laughs> That's the scenario that we thought might be most useful for now, but um, it's interesting, yeah. interesting yeah. thought. Thank you. Yeah. There's another question here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, because you started the talk uh, and showing us some uh, tools and uh, in VR to make... The time when we did this test, it was 2015, early 2015. Um, and um, it was more the results of the evaluation that made us a bit um, um, yeah, reluctant to, to go further into that direction for a acceptable tool. and. Um, there was also something I didn't mention in the presentation, but the person wearing the headset felt very um, disconnected from the rest of the scenery. Um, but having said that, I, uh, you know, we're already thinking about a client for HoloLens, uh, but uh, the interaction isn't, isn't simple. I actually, uh, I think I have another video of a, you know, it doesn't really, this video doesn't really, um, uh, connect to the full system, but it's the first try of, um, you know, just bringing content to the HoloLens and trying to interact with it. So you have different voice commands where you can switch to robots, you have gestures where you can move it around. Uh, I find it, I, I find it um, very interesting and um, I, I like how well it integrates. Um, in terms of the same functionality we have on the tablet where we can animate, we can have um, light parameters. Um, it's going to be a challenge to put this into a user interface that you can easily um, manipulate with, with gestures, um, but it's certainly something we, we have in our mind and, and would be nice to have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe to add, and the other point is so well, basically the idea behind the decision to go for a mobile device is that nearly everyone has one in his package. Yeah. That's so, uh, the part of democratization of virtual production. So um, you've seen in the first 20 minutes that uh, we've been trying to push this idea for a long time using game engines or real-time engines, but um, uh, it took, took a long time for us within Film Academy until the students were really up to 
taking that idea, but there was also some reluctance in, in terms of, oh wow, we need, okay, we need a first a mocap system, we need expensive hardware, things like that. This has come down uh, um, a lot. I mean, of course, an income system is still an investment, the same as a mocap system, but you've seen with, you know, very affordable hardware, you can already achieve quite good results. But does not mean that we stuck to tablets. You can see here, as an example, yeah. that's also possible to port it on the HoloLens, for example, or other systems. I think. Uh, um, d do we have time for more questions? Or one more question. One yes. more question. Okay, if there is one. No. Oh, there's there's another over there. I think. So uh, in recent, like in the recent year, uh, USD has come out. Uh, have you considered using USD as a kind of like bridge between like uh, pipelines, offline pipelines, mm. VR pipelines, mm. and mm. getting it into the different TCCs? Yes, we thought about it, but uh, in our case, it's much easier to have our own protocol here. So um, USD, for example, would be really nice to fit information back to the system. But at the moment, uh, uh, to a production system. But at the moment, we are realizing this by this plug-in structure. So it would be an alternative and would be a nice point at, at the recording side for it.